still interested and not and not bored. It was bad weather. Yeah, and it's going to do it again. It looks like too. So. Okay, so um, tonight's talk is is really about the medications that are used to treat glaucoma. That's really the main topic tonight. But it's hard to talk about that unless we talk also about what's what are we trying to accomplish when we treat people for glaucoma. Now, those of you who missed the um, the first two lectures, I'll bring you up to speed so you'll be able to follow tonight's talk. Because we'll, because to talk about why we treat glaucoma, we have to cover a little bit about what glaucoma is, which was the first first lecture we gave. And we also have to talk about the tests we use a little bit. Okay? So um, let's, let's do a little bit of review for the new people uh, and people who haven't uh, heard any of this before. And, um, and then we'll talk real intensively about the medicines that we use. Now, to put this in context with the rest of the lectures we'll have, there's two more to follow. As you know, or you may be aware, next week we're taking a break. And then we'll have two more lectures on the two consecutive Wednesday nights after that. The first one's going to be on, on lasers and surgery. So, in other words, the first two lectures were really on what is glaucoma, how do we diagnose it, and what kind of testing do we do. This, the next two are going to be on treatment, and we're going to start with medications. And next time we'll talk about lasers and surgery for glaucoma. And then the last section is going to be on uh, the, to the, cop the topic of the combination of cataracts and glaucoma together. It's such a common topic. And you'll notice if, that's mar you know, if it's advertised right in the community, you'll see a whole different group of people come for that particular concern. There's a lot of people who have a cataract that have glaucoma that have been a little bit indecisive about what to do. And there's always a number of them out in the community. Whenever I've given that talk, it brings in a whole different crowd. It's very interesting. OK, so let's go back a little bit and talk about, just to summarize for the first few minutes, you know, what is glaucoma? What isn't it? Uh, bottom line is glaucoma, we, we spent a whole hour on the first time talking about what glaucoma is and what it's not. And what it's not, and the, the, real, es the real essence of that talk is that it's not the pressure. A lot of people think glaucoma is pressure, right? Uh, that's what we thought. Everybody thought that. That's very common knowledge. Um, in the community, people think that. The public at large think glaucoma is pressure in the eye, but we really discuss that it's not. It's really a disease of the optic nerve. And to really briefly illustrate, we have, we have a brain. It's my favorite, favorite diagram, medical diagram, brain. And then we have two eyes that look out into the world. And what we talked about is that we don't see with our eyes. We really see with our brain, and the back of our brain is a part of the brain that coordinates seeing. And the, in, the information that your eyes send in, like TV cameras, will send back through a cable to the brain. And this cable is called the optic nerve. That cable is what's damaged in glaucoma. Glaucoma is a type of damaged, damage that occurs to the optic nerve. And what we found is there's a lot of things about patients that have glaucoma but the most common things they have are things like family history, pressure in the eye, a lot of them have that, um, nearsightedness, and a lot of them are of dark skin races. And that's the, those are some of the major risk factors for getting glaucoma. So what we found out is that pressure is not a, isn't what the disease is, but it's very closely associated with it for a lot of patients, but not all. In fact, as many as one out of five or one out of seven people have a type of glaucoma where the pressure is never, ever, ever higher than, quote, whatever normal is, normal. So there's other factors that cause it. And we also talked about, since we knew this about glaucoma, and we've discovered this about glaucoma, we just said, okay, now how are we going to treat this disease? What are we going to do to stop people from going blind from it? And what we really found out is that of all the things that seem to be associated with and maybe are causes of glaucoma that I mentioned, like genetics X, and all the other things I mentioned, the only thing we really can do is alter the pressure because we can't seem to do much about the other things that seem to be related to it. So when we start treatment for glaucoma, we usually aim our treatment at the pressure in the eye because we really don't know what else to do. And over the years, it's proved to be a very effective way of stopping the disease, most of the time, <laughs> if you can lower the pressure enough early enough before the vision's lost. So we end up 
saving this optic nerve by lowering the pressure. And once we diagnose the disease, we end up starting to treat the disease. And most of the treatment and discussion about how the patient is doing with the doctor revolves around the pressure. How are we doing today, doc? Oh, your pressure is good. So we end up forgetting all that stuff that we just talked about and re-educating the patient to think that the pressure is their disease. So in other words, after we straighten out the confusion, we then confuse people again by emphasizing the pressure so much. But now, you all here that have been to the first two talks know that there's other things to look at. We start looking at other things about the eye. We start examining the optic nerve. We look at it every year. We look at the visual field. Every year is a measure of visual function. In other words, the damaged optic nerve shows up as a functional visual field problem. And we start measuring the visual field. And we do it sequentially because glaucoma is a disease of change. And well, there's some other little technical things that we look at in the front of the eye to determine the type of glaucoma. Okay? So, that sort of sets us up for where we are. So what we do when we treat glaucoma is we lower the pressure. Well, how do we know where we want the pressure? And that's sort of what I wanted to get into a little more. We, have, we talked about that a little bit before. In fact, I encourage some of the people who are here to go and talk to their doctor and find out some things like, well, how low does the doctor want the pressure? Have any of you been to the doctor to ask that question in the meanwhile? Well, you, you're ahead of us. You were doing it on your own. <laughs> Did he tell you how low he wanted your pressure to be? No, oh, but the first time I went, 17 in my left eye. And right. right. So the first time you went, it was no, a normal kind of a pressure. Uh, a month later, after medication, I went down to 13. And okay, so you're an example of somebody that never really had high pressure because the pressures were normal to start with. So obviously there was something else about your eyes that your doctor picked up that made him think. There you go. He found it because the optic nerve looks suspicious. Yeah. So that's, that's good. That's very not so common that that's diagnosed that way. I don't see the medication not here anywhere that I'm taking. All right, we'll get, we're going to get to that. Okay. You're ahead. Everybody's ahead of me all the time. That's good. Um, okay, so let's talk about how we know how low we want the pressure to be. Okay. Okay, so what we have to find out is what's the pressure when the diagnosis is made. So I call that the initial pressure. The initial pressure. In other words, what it was when the glaucoma was found. Now, most of you who have glaucoma will have had it diagnosed because the pressure was high. That's how it was found. So we generally consider anything above 24 suspicious. But not every, a lot of people get glaucoma with pressures ranging in the uh, low 20s. It's not uncommon to see people start with that. And we also talked a lot about how the pressure can vary from day to day and how it's important when somebody's suspicious for glaucoma to not just jump in and treat them and to see them a few different days, a few different times of the day when the pressure may vary considerably. So you find out <clears throat> if that was done if the patient can remember or the, they get the records if they can't, you look back and see what was the range of pressure. So this gentleman back here said he had pressures in the upper teens. Well, he might have come back on another day. It may have been 25. We don't know, but it's possible that could have happened. So you want to know where you're starting from, okay? And then we generally will want to lower the pressure as a general rule. If you really have optic nerve damage, we'll want to lower it about 30% from where it starts. Approximately. Now, that's, that's if somebody has sort of average or early glaucoma, not a lot of damage. So let's say, let's, we'll do this by sort of scenarios. Let's say somebody comes in and has a pressure of 30, and they have a little early damage of the optic nerve. And they find it's pretty consistently 30. So let's say it was 30 to start with. We're going to say that here's the initial pressures. And let's say how much damage, how, how damaged, um, how much damage, and then we're going to set a target pressure, target pressure, a 
target pressure. This will be how low do we want the pressure to go to stop the disease. It's also called something else called a pressure goal. Now let's just do a few simple, not too complicated cases here. So you'll get the idea. Now let's say they have early. We'll call these, we'll say either early, moderate, or advanced for the damage. They have early damage. Let's say it was 30 to start with, and they have early damage. We probably want to bring it down about 30%. That's pretty obvious. That would be a 10-point lowering or so. So we want to get it down probably to 20. Target pressure for this particular person. Well, this is good in theory, but there's some little things we're going to adjust about some of these numbers I'm going to tell you in just a minute. But let's say the pressure was, like this gentleman, was 17. Well, let's say it varied between 15 and 20 because we saw variation. Now you have to realize this could, you have to set a target pressure for each eye because one eye may be early damaged. One, may I, one eye may not even have glaucoma and the other eye could have pretty bad glaucoma. It happens that way sometimes. So let's say the pressure in the eye we're talking about varies from 15 to 20 and they have some moderate damage. Now, this is, a tip, this is a case of what we would call normal pressure glaucoma. This isn't the typical glaucoma. Normal pressure glaucoma. We generally would want to lower the pressure down a good, a good percentage. We might want to bring it down, in this case, down with moderate damage. We'd want to lower it maybe more than 30%. We might want to go toward 50%, get it down to the low teens. These are the kind of goals you'll see. Your doctor may mention, he's not going to say, I want 12. He's going to say low teens, mid teens, upper teens, low 20s. Okay. Now, you also have to realize that this 30% has other factors in it. You have to look at how many risk factors the patient has. If they have, if they're, if they're dark skinned race, they're high nearsighted, their father was blind from glaucoma, that may force you to alter that reading, that percent you want to lower it by even more. But, Let's do another case here. Let's say their pressures are running 25 to 32. I'm going to have a little question for you now. But there's no damage and there's no optic nerve looks healthy. Well, what do we call this person? We have a word for that person. How many of you can remember what we call that person? Any of you remember? Do they have glaucoma? No. Who said that? Who said it again? Suspect. Right. Glaucoma. Suspect. Suspect. We'll say suspect. But it runs from 25 to 32. There's no damage. Well, if they're a glaucoma suspect, we may elect not to treat it and leave it just where it is and say 28 is a good goal for them on average. We usually don't want it above 30. If, if anybody's got, if, some, if somebody has pressures consistently in the 30s, we're almost always going to want to treat that even if there's no other risk factor. If you remember in that first lecture, we talked about that graph with the pressures and how often the risk of losing sight. When you get above 30, the chances of having glaucoma are much higher. You get above 40, almost everybody with a pressure above 40 has glaucoma. When you get down to below 30, you start to see the big split where a lot of people just don't seem to be getting it over a long period of time. We call them glaucoma suspects based on pressure. So we might leave this person untreated. Okay, you'll start to get a feel for this. It may be a little confusing, but you'll get the feel for this. Now, um, there's a couple clinkers. We've also learned over the years that even though this 30% sounds good, people that have real glaucoma, real glaucoma with real damage, not maybe damage, suspicious nerve, funny looking fields that might be normal one year and abnormal the other, if they really have it, we always want to go below 17. That's a big important number. If somebody has real glaucoma, 17. Now, let's talk about somebody with advanced glaucoma. Let's say their pressures start out 26. They have advanced glaucoma, where they're really close to losing their center vision. It's a scary looking visual field. The optic nerve is pretty good, but it almost looks dead when you look at it, like completely cupped. We might want their pressure down to 10 or sometimes even below 10. Now, when people have advanced glaucoma, we've learned that the more severe the disease, 
you start going from 17 is your high point to below 10 when they have very advanced glaucoma. We've just learned from our experience over years. And that seems to, when the disease gets advanced, that seems to take precedence over this whole other question about where they started. And it takes into account even these people with normal pressure glaucoma. You want to get it below 10 sometimes in people where you know it's getting worse. And that's another thing. What our target pressure is, this is for starting out. But we learn a lot over the years we take care of our patients. And we see them sometimes 20 years. Sure, I've been in practice for 18 years. I have a lot of patients I started with me 15, 18 years ago. And a lot of them come down to me from up north and they'll have had glaucoma for 20 or 30 years. And we'll get all their records together. And it's, it's very valuable to look through it. It's very time consuming. Nobody really wants to sit and do it because it takes longer than it takes to do a normal exam. You really have to take some time out and really sit down and look through it. But you may find that they were getting worse at some period over maybe a three or five year period. Their visual fields were getting worse or their optic nerve was getting worse, more damaged. And what's very, very valuable in that time is to see what was the pressure and when that was occurring. Because we find a lot of people, as they get older, the circulation isn't as good. And they'll start to get worse at a pressure where they already were stable. In other words, you do the 30% rule, and it looks like that should do it. And then they get up in their 80s and 90s, and they start getting worse anyway. So you look and say, what was that pressure then? Because if you don't do that, and you apply an arbitrary rule, you may make an error that you could have avoided by looking at the old records. Say that again? You pick the wrong target amount. Well, sometimes, yeah. Well, well, you, but if you look at the records and see, then you can then say, okay, they got worse at 17. Let's go 30% lower than that now. Now let's go down to 12 or 10. Even though they started out with 30 when you thought 17 would be good enough, now they've gone from early to advanced. Well, if they're already advanced, we know we're going to go down toward 10. But if they're getting worse, Look at where it was getting worse, and it's very, very helpful. So once we go through this initial consideration and make a target pressure, we're then in the process of saying, okay, now how are we going to get the pressure down to the levels we want it to? Now, a lot of times when I've seen patients over years, I have a, por a portion of my sh chart where I have a summary of the target pressures. And you'll see it started out 17, went to 15, went to 12 in some of these people because they kept getting worse in a way that you didn't expect. <clears throat> it's almost as though we need to start thinking as people get older, we should arbitrarily start lowering it. But that's not fair sometimes because it might subject somebody to an unnecessary surgery or extra medicines that can have side effects. Hang on just a minute. I know you. he has a burning question. Yeah, some people, people definitely age differently. Okay, so that's a brief summary of like where we get to, how, we want, how low we want to get. I didn't want to jump right into the medicines because I wanted to put it in context for you. Okay, so let's see. You had a question. We'll take a couple questions, then we'll go into the medicines. Okay, um, you're referring to some, something you read somewhere, you say I wrote it. <laughs> well, well, there was an article in the newspaper not too long ago, this past season, about somebody who had a kind of glaucoma. We were talking about somebody who had normal pressure glaucoma and the fact that um, there's other things besides the pressure that uh, cause the glaucoma and perhaps it's a circulation factor. Now, we don't know what that circulation factor is to measure it. Well, it's, the blood supply to the optic nerve is thought to be to pose a major um, is a major cause of glaucoma. It's thought to be because we find that when we study blood so blood flow with some of the newer technologies, we can actually measure the blood flow. The people who have glaucoma have altered blood flow, usually less. Well, not that we know of. We're working on those kinds of things by using vaso. We tried calcium channel blockers like verapamil that's supposed to uh, dilate blood vessels. The problem is sometimes they dilate the blood vessels in your feet and your arms and your blood pressure goes down. And even though it may open up the blood vessels to the, to the arteries in the eye, 
uh, it also, if it lowers the blood pressure, it may have a deleterious effect. In other words, it may, may not really help. We'd like to be able to selectively increase the blood flow and see if that would help. But we really don't know if the blood supply is down because, as a causative factor or whether it's down just because there's more the nerve's dead and now it doesn't need blood anymore, so the body shuts it off. So maybe the blood vessels die along with the nerve, and then we're seeing as a result of the glaucoma not a cause. So we really don't really know for sure, but we really have a thought that blood supply is a very important causative factor. Unfortunately, we don't have any drugs that we, we use for the purpose of increasing blood flow. There are some side benefits of some of these drugs that are thought to help in that way, but it's not been proven that that really is a re reason why it helps people. Um, they yes. Right. So, so you're at. You're at. Yes. Okay. Let me restate your question so it makes sense. If, see if I got it. You're wondering if, if the blood supply to the, caro the to the, to the eye, which comes through the carotid artery. Yeah. So if that's blocked off, can that be a cause of? It's been looked at. It's been looked at, but it's not really found that there's a direct correlation. You would think that perhaps there would be. There's definitely a correlation with clogged up arteries and strokes in the brain and clogged up arteries that lead to the eye causing retinal disease and literally almost a stroke in the retina. So these things, can, these things do happen, but it's not been correlated to glaucoma. It, we think there's some small vessel disease right at the edge of the optic nerve that may be a factor in that. Oh, it acts okay. The optic nerve is actually. Let's do a little close up right here, okay? Here comes the nerve. Here's the eyeball. Okay. See the close up? That's the back of the eyeball. The, what, the, what the nerve is made of is all the, the cells on the inner lining of the eye here are called the retina. And there's little cells here. It goes all around, okay? These little cell bodies, they're like nucleus of the cells, you know, the nucleus, they have these long things called axons that go down the nerve. Actually, they're, and they go all the way into the brain, these axons. Yeah, but and they all come from the retina. So these, these are all lined up on the retina, and that's where they come from. So it's not just stuck there. There's a, these are actually live tissue that's, that's the cell bodies are in the retina. They, they transmit that energy all the way. Back. Yeah, well, that there is. There's a bony. There's a bone that goes around. This, that's the socket, and there's a hole in it. The optic nerve gets through. Well, there's not a wall. There's little holes in the wall. There is a wall. It's like a bone, but there's holes in it that the nerves and blood vessels go through. Yeah, the brain's really literally right behind it. Right behind it. Okay. Well, right. Didn't have that well, there's other nerves that come in yeah. that but move the eye around and do all kinds of, you know, do other things with the eye, make the pupil get smaller and larger. The other end of the nerve enters into the brain itself. Yes. That's it's the same cells are all go all the way through the whole thing, all the way down the nerve and all the way into the brain. Yes. Somebody had a mastoid what? Surgery. Oh, mastoid surgery. Okay, now that's back here behind the ear. Um, and you're wondering if that has something to do with their, not that I know of. I don't think so. Okay, I want to, do you have any questions about the basic principles? Because I want to see, we, we're gonna, we got only about another half hour and I want to get into the medications. Sure. How frequently should it be checked? Um, if, if the person has real glaucoma and they're stable, uh, we would generally do the field about once every year or so. And we would look, check the pressure 
every, and depending on the severity, of the, it's very variable. We talked about that before. And if you talk to me afterwards, I can tell you how you can actually, we're videotaping these lectures and you can get one and you can actually review the whole thing. We talked about that in detail, but it's, to answer your question, it's very variable and it depends on the case. If the glaucoma is controlled and they really have glaucoma, we see them about three times a year. We do the field about once a year and we do a dilated exam and look at the optic nerve about once a year as well. But if they're very stable for long periods of time, we may go longer on that. If they're glaucoma suspects, however, in this category, we may see them every six to nine months or even once a year sometimes, depending on why they're a suspect and what the risk factors are. So there's no hard rule. And if they're having problems, we might see them every two weeks or every three days. I have people that have walked into my office in the past few days with very high pressures, I mean, 40s, 50s, and we're trying to get it down to a reasonable level. Oh, absolutely. And uh, presenting with all kinds of unusual secondary glaucomas. And they need, you know, they may need surgery. And we're trying to see if we can get the pressure reasonable and things like that. And really severe cases. So there's a lot of that. OK, I want you to get your green sheets out. And we're going to go through some of the medications so you'll have a sense of how we think about it. Now, those of you who are watching the videotape, you should have one of these. Also, it'll come with the videotape. <laughs> so you can get that out. And what you'll see on the sheet, um, it goes on two sides, is that there's different classifications of drugs that have different mechanisms of actions. And we've grouped the medications into different groups. Now, there's an awful lot of medicines on there. And when we start treating people, we don't just take a dart and throw it at the board. We look at what's likely to help them. But one of the rules about this, you know when you go to a Chinese restaurant, you can pick one from column A and one from column B. It sort of works like this. But think of each classification as one. So you generally would not pick more than one drug from the same classification of drugs. For the simple reason that if you take one drug in that class, the second drug's not going to do any more. Because that mechanism of action has now been taken up by the first drug. So you would pick one from each column if you're going to use more than one. Now, I want to go through these a little bit. Uh, how many of you are actually taking drops? So this will have some relevance for you. Just OK, so three of you are. So this will have some direct relevance for you. Um, but let's go through the, the way we, how do we lower pressure in the eye? Let's, let's talk about the concept of that. Let's um, sort of start over again here a little bit. We'll do it over here so we can. The eye is a, a relatively firm, has a very t relatively firm wall around it. Um, you know, it has this, has this shape we always draw. You're, it's like a round ball, but you only see the front of it. And of course, there's a nerve in the back. But the eye makes fluid, and fluid drains out. We talked about this in one of our earlier lectures. It all happens up in the front of the eye. There's something here called the ciliary body in the front of the eye. And that makes fluid ciliary body. Makes fluid. And then the fluid drains out in the front part of the eye through what we call the trabecular meshwork. Or the drain. We're going to call it the drain. Trabecu trabecular mesh. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of brilliance to figure out that there's two ways, at least, of lowering the pressure in the eye. How, how would you do it? There's two ways you could do it. Can anybody give me an idea? How, you would, how would you get the pressure to go down in this eye? Have the fluid drain out faster. So we pump this up, make this work, but work, make this work better. Increase the effectiveness of the drain. Make it work better. That would get the pressure down. That worked very well. How about another way? Decrease the fluid. There you go. I mean, it's very typical, very simple physics. We're not, you know, we're doctors. We're not, you know, what we came up with works on basically that's the two mechanisms that almost all these drugs act on, except one class at the end, which I'll tell you about that's new. So, since we were trying to lower pressure, we found drugs that would do that. So, in the first class of drugs is called myotics. And what they do is they lower the pressure in the eye. If you read it, increase drainage out of the eye through the trabecular meshwork to lower the pressure. Now, traditionally, those drugs all have a green cap. 
So those of you who take drops, if you have a green cap drop, you can almost always ascribe it to that category. Now, you'll notice in their drugs, pilocarpine, ocuserts, that's a type of pilocarpine, carbacol, phospholine, iodide, all of these are different strengths of drugs. Now, the, these drugs are very effective, extremely effective. The problems we have with them, if you notice the side effects of those, look what the side effects are. They're eye side effects. Dim, they're brow aches, the eye gets achy, blurry vision. Those are some of the side effects that some people get with them, not all people. It varies depending on the eye and the person. It's hard to predict ahead of time. I'd say 30% um, uh, of people have some uh, achiness trying to get used to it. 10% of people can't tolerate it at all. And the other thing about them is notice that the drugs are used pretty frequently, four, three, or two times a day. The phospholine iodide is usually only reserved for patients that have had cataract surgery, and since there's a chance of causing detached retinas, we generally don't use that drug unless it's a severe case. So the common drug we would use would be pilocarpine. But we f we'll find out as we talk that most of the newer drugs that have been developed recently have been developed to try to make it so people can remember to take them. And four times a day is very hard to remember. But we find that if, uh, if, you, peop if you have a person taking a drug only once a day, almost half the time they're going to forget to take it in a few week period of time. They're going to miss a dose. Now, if you have to take it four times a day, you're probably going to be missing a dose every few days. And we know that. So this is why we don't use this drug as much as we used to. But in the beginning, it was one of the few drugs that were available, and it was always used when I was in training tw over 20 years ago. So that's how these drugs work. But notice the side effects are in the eye. They're not in the body. Okay? Now, the next classification of drugs, I'm going to call beta blockers. Oh, Ocucert is a type of pilocarpine. Is a type of pilocarpine. And the reason it's done is because it's like, a, it's like a contact lens you put up under your lid. And it slowly releases the drug for two weeks. It's very long acting. Now, some people still use this, but it's, most people find it uh, difficult to handle. Having to take it out and it falls into their, it, it comes out from under their eyelid and gets in front of their eye. They don't like the way it feels. Uh, I guess you uh, it would be difficult to use if you wear contacts. But I guess you could try it. I've never seen anybody do that. It's not very commonly used. Okay, so we're going to shift to the next class of drugs, which are called the beta blockers. And they came, they came out in around 1978. And this was a major breakthrough in our treatment because the studies showed that people tolerated it much better than the pilocarpine that was really a, the only, was really one of the only few drugs that were available. And people had a lot of side effects and couldn't tolerate it. So this new drug came out. And you'll notice if you look through the side effects, what do you see about the eye? Right, there are very, very few side effects about the eye. And when this drug was first released, it was touted as the wonder drug that has no side effects. The beta blockers, the second one was what we're talking about. The whole category in general we're talking about. So, but we didn't think there were side effects from that when it first came out. And it took us a while to discover that a little eye drop put in the eye can have very severe effects on the body. And nobody believed it at first. I had patients when I first came to town here who were having terrible breathing problems. And the pulmonary doctors would always say, oh, it's only an eye drop. That couldn't do that. But we've learned that's not true. But you can imagine how excited we were to get this class of drugs that was extremely effective and didn't cause almost any eye problems. It was really, really wonderful. But you'll notice how they work. Look at the action. Decrease the formation of aqueous humor to lower pressure. It works by this opposite mechanism. So what do you think we thought about this when it came out? How wonderful for those people that were on pilocarpine and weren't controlled. We could then add another drug that had a different mechanism of action, and we could get a double whammy. It was very nice to have to go at this problem from both ends. So we were very excited about this, and so we started seeing a lot of people with side effects. That's the fluid in the eye. That's the fluid. And you'll notice there's a lot of different drugs in this category. 
and probably if, if you're taking glaucoma medicines, this is usually the first drug most doctors would prescribe. Taking into account you have to watch out for people with asthma, irregular heartbeats, problems having taken oral beta blockers in the past. So if you, if you carefully screen people, you can generally pick out the ones that will have problems and put them on this drug and they'll do very well with it. It has a very nice effect. This drug can often lower the pressure 30% all by itself. Very effective. That's correct. These are the same drugs that are used for lowering blood pressure. Well, it is in a sense. You said it's not a side effect. It doesn't say that, but what's a side effect when you have, um, you can get dizziness. I mean, those would be some of the side effects you could get, but that's not the most common thing we see. We don't see that as people getting dizziness as the most common side effect of that drug. Usually it's breathing problems. But the dizziness that's there, that would be because the blood pressure went low. So we tried to make this more symptomatic rather than diagnostic and have it say blood pressure would drop. So this, this class of drugs still to this day is the most popular prescribed drug for glaucoma. This class, those are all a bunch of different drugs, but if you add them all together, they're the most popular ones. Most frequently prescribed eye drop class is this. Okay, so let's go on to the epinephrine drugs. Epinephrine would be like adrenaline. Now that's been around for a while. But you can see by looking right, well, the way it works is, look how it works. It works by a combination of both mechanisms. It's not the most potent drugs. They were used for many years in the past, but an awful lot of people couldn't tolerate it because of the side effects. Notice again, the side effects were ocular, eye side effects, stinging, burning, red eye, eye pain. Now some people would get palpitations because the adrenaline would get in their system and make their heart beat faster, but that wasn't that common. And then along came this drug at the bottom of that class called propene. And that came out around the early, very early 1980s. And that drug is adrenaline packaged in a way where it isn't active. If you, in the, if you, you could take the eye drop bottle and inject it in your vein, it would have very little effect on you. Not like adrenaline, which would have an amazing effect on you. It would be broken down to epinephrine or adrenaline inside the eye. And it would, could be done, given in a much lower dosage. So this was a very novel drug. It's still a good drug, and, but most doctors don't use it today. Because, uh, you know why? I mean, here's, it's, it's a bad reason. The, the reason is the drug is now uh, released and you can go generics for it. None of the drug companies make a lot of money on it anymore. And when the sales reps come around, they don't even, the company, the propane, they don't even show me propane anymore. They don't talk about it. They want you to use the newer drugs on the back where they're making their most of the profit. Well, you know, it's still a very potentially effective drug for a lot of patients, and it's often neglected, particularly propane. It's hard to even find the other drugs that are above that anymore. On the, they're still made, but they're very difficult to get. Would you consider prescribing it? Oh, I have a lot of people I put them on. Yeah. I have a lot of patients I put on it. I don't choose to put them on it as a first-line drug, but I used to do that a lot a long time ago. But it's, it's a, still a good drug, so that's the point. So if any of you are looking at this for, you're looking for another drug that might be potentially useful, you can go to your doctor and say, what about propane? He'll probably say, that's a good idea, let's try it. It's not something on the tip of people's tongues anymore. Now we're going to go to the back. So we've covered three classes of drugs so far. There's three more. These are called the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. It's a complicated name. But these drugs are very good at lowering the amount of fluid the eye makes. And it's often additive to other drugs that work by the same mechanism. Now, you'll notice there's pills and drops. The pills have been around for years and years and years and years. But they've had a very bad track record of causing a lot of side effects. Probably over 50% of the people who were given that drug eventually had to stop it because of side effects that are listed. Tommy doesn't want pills, huh? <laughs> I like that. 
So, so these these pills have been around for ages, and we generally would we would use them very we'd use them a lot, but we knew in the back of our mind that a lot of people wouldn't tolerate them. Well, along comes Trusopt or Dorzolamide, the drop that's listed there. That came out about must be three or four years ago, and that's reintroduced this drug as a good potential useful drug in our practice, and it's very comp very popular right now. And it doesn't, because you're only putting a little drop in your eye and you're not getting much in your system, the, the uh, side effect frequency has dropped considerably. But still, some people still get the same side effects they used to get from the pills with these, this particular drop. Can you put the, you keep asking about contact lenses. Yes, some of them you can and some of them you can't. Some of them you can and some of them you can't. Some of them turn the contact lens a little yellow, um, and some of them, but generally you can put them in, yeah. But some, if there's, if there's clear fluids and not suspensions, yeah, so you can use some of them. But that, that's, a lot of them, um, you know, you ask me that question, I don't know the answer. I'd have to go to the manufacturer and ask them, and they might not know either for some of the newer drugs. What we often do with people with contact lenses, we'll, if they take them out every day, we'll have them try to use a twice a day or no more than twice a day drug so they can put it in before they put their contact in. And then after they take their contact out, put it in again before they go to bed. So, but if you wear the extended wear contact lenses, that's a different problem. So also notice on the side effects that there is occasionally bone marrow depression and a rare death. Now that scared a lot of doctors into never ever using that class of drugs. A lot of, when I first came to town, I used a lot of the pills, and I took a survey of the doctors in the area by mail, and I found that a good percentage of them was they say they never ever will use it because of that possibility. They're worried about liability. And they're worried about hurting somebody. Now, that hasn't happened yet with the drop, so we're hoping that the chances of that happening will be a lot lower. But these drugs are really well tolerated. There's another drug that's not on this current sheet. It's called Azopt. I don't know if it's on yours. A-Z-O-P-T. It's on, oh, you have the newer version then. That's another drug that's another drop that's similar. That just came out recently. Now, let's go on to talk about the next class of drugs. That's the alpha-2 agonists. Now, you'll notice their action is to decrease the amount of uh, fluid the eye makes. It's really the basic mechanism it works by. And there's two of these drugs. One's called apoclonidine or iopidine, and the other's alphagan or bromonidine. Uh, these, this drug is very interesting. The, the first one, the iopidine, is extremely interesting because it really was developed for very short-term use when we do laser treatments on people's eyes, which we'll be talking about the next session we meet. Once, when, once in a while when you do the laser, the pressure will go extremely high for the first day. And we found this drug, when added, put in right before the laser, had its tremendous, caused a tremendous drop in the pressure. And it overwhelmed that, the eye so that that just didn't happen very often. It made it safer to do laser. Well, once it was released, you know, we doctors could do whatever we want with it. And we found that, gee, there's a few people here that had uncontrolled glaucoma that didn't want surgery or we'd say, gee, let's just try it and see if it'll work. And we started prescribing this drug that was really not intended for long-term use. And we found that a certain, about a good number of people, half the, half the people would get a significant continuing lowering of the pressure. But the problem with that drug is it makes a, about a third of the patients get a terrible redness and irritation of the eye after a while. So it, people would, it would work for a while. It was good for short-term putting off things but it wasn't really good for long-term treatment. And if, if you're going to have a third to 40% of your patients having problems with it, we'd really try another drug. You don't want them having to come back. Well, if you're going to take it for 20 years, right, you're not going to run around with a red eye, for sure. So in, in its heels, um, bromonidine was, was investigated and released, which doesn't have a very, has a much lower chance of making the eye irritated and red. And it, it made it possible for us to use this class of drugs on a longer term basis without having that problem. The problem with bromonidine is unlike um, iopidine, it's, it, it gets into the bloodstream and it can cause blood pressure lowering. This, this drug particularly can lower the blood pressure. 
And uh, that's why you'll see decrease in blood pressure there. And that's a problem for some patients. It works like clonidine. It's almost like clonidine, but it's not, it's not the same. We, actually, if you put clonidine in somebody's eye in this class, it does lower the pressure in the eye, but they usually will, their blood pressure will drop precipitously. And, and as we were talking about before, do we want to drop the blood pressure? That, that could be, you know, you could be making the eye's pressure lower, but yet if the blood flow to the eye is, is lowered because the blood pressure is lowered, maybe it's a double-edged sword and you're making the pressure look good, but the glaucoma can now get worse at a lower pressure. You know, these are a lot of the thoughts that we have about some of these agents, including the beta blockers. There's people that think that. So the effect on the blood flow may counteract some of the, uh, the, the, some of the, uh, the beneficial effects that we try to get from the drugs by lowering the pressure. Of course, we can't measure the blood flow very effectively, so we don't know what we're doing back there. All we know is the pressure in the eye went down, that we still have to monitor them. See, that's why when people say, gee, doctor, if my pressure is lower, why do you have to keep doing my visual field? Well, it's obvious because we don't know if the drugs we're using to lower the pressure are also making the eye more susceptible to the disease. So they could then get worse at a lower pressure. And maybe some of what we see today where we want to get the pressures down to 10 is artificially, to some degree, slightly artificially induced by side effects of the drugs and the effects on the circulation. This we don't know. This Don't take this as to mean don't take your drops. doesn't mean you should go say, I'm not going to take them and I don't like, I don't want any drops. Don't do that because we don't have any proof of what I'm saying. These are just thoughts that we have. Okay, we're going to go talk about the last class on here, the prostaglandin analogs. These are, th this drug, Zalatan, is, you've probably seen articles in the paper about it. It was released about, must be a year and a half or two years ago. And this was like, um, this is a major breakthrough because it was an entirely new class of drugs. And we had very little experience in the body using this class of drugs at all. The only use in the body is for inducing labor. They give this the prostaglandin that's given to women to help in the delivery process. So really there's very little known about the medical side effects of this drug. So notice it works by a different mechanism. So we're very excited about this drug because it works in a different way. Now, it increases UVO scleral outflow. That's a whole new concept I haven't covered. I'll tell you real quickly what it is. Fluid can get out of the eye other ways. It's generally considered that most of the fluid goes out through the trabecular meshwork. But sometimes when the trabecular meshwork is clogged up, and there is a, and also a certain, well, there's a small percentage that goes out it goes out through the ciliary body and out through the scleral wall. Now, normally it's probably less than 10% of the normal outflow. But when somebody has inflammation in their eye called uveitis, it becomes a very important mechanism. And the fl and pressure goes down in people who have that disease because this outflow goes up. So what this drug does is it create, it takes a mechanism of fluid getting out that's normally very a very small portion of it and it exaggerates it. So that it, it, it gives us a third mechanism to work with. So you can imagine we're excited about that. It's a new class of drugs and it's additive to the others. We like that idea. Now how, you know, because if you're on three different drugs that decrease the production of fluid, you wonder what the third one's going to do when you're already on two that do the same thing. But if you add a drug from another class here or there, then it's very exciting to think that you sh it, theoretically you think, okay, that should give us another way to lower the pressure. So if you're going to be on three drugs, maybe you'd want to be on one that does this, one that does this, and one that does that. That would be, all, it would be ideal if it would, if it would work that way. But in the real world, it doesn't always work that way. And sometimes you'll have, people, you'll have somebody on, uh, already on a, a, like a beta blocker, and you'll add Trusopt, which works by the same mechanism, and it'll have a significant lowering. And you say, gee, it shouldn't do that. Why does it do that? But it does. So everybody doesn't operate like you would expect them to operate. Oh, I will get to that. You're asking me how, you're sort of shocked that somebody would have to take two or more drugs. You should come to my office someday and follow me around for a while. You would not believe how many medications people have to take. Let's talk a little more about this, though, before we go on. Um, this, these prostaglandin analogs have some um, concerns, however, they're new. And remember, we talked about 
when the beta blockers came out, we were, they were touted as the drug that has no side effects until later we learned that it did have side effects. Well, well now we're doing a grand experiment with Zalatan. There's a lot of doctors that are even using this as a first-line drug. Now, most glaucoma specialists would generally, at least right now, and that may change soon, say, well, we'd like to try a beta blocker first if you can. If you can't, well, then maybe we would consider some of the other drugs as a first-line treatment. Like if, if somebody had bad asthma. Hang on, I want to just, I will, I will, I will, I promise you I'll get to you. Um, so this Zalatan, we like it for that reason. Now sometimes, remember I talked about how the uveous scleral flow increases in inflammation. Interestingly, a lot of, not a lot of people, some people who take Zalatan get inflamed eyes from it. They also can get retinal edema if they're prone to it. And the, so it's not, not a perfect drug. Also, see how it's, the eye turns darker color. Now, not everybody's eye does that. People with hazel eyes tend to do that the most. Dark brown eyes, you really can't see it if it turns darker. Light blue eyes don't seem to do that with this drug. But if you have a hazel eye, it will turn permanently darker. Interesting. Also, the eyelashes get thicker, darker, and curlier. In fact, there's some glaucoma specialists that are taking this bottle and they're smearing it on their heads. And now, I don't know if they're getting results from it, but they were talking about that at the last meeting I was at. <laughs> so it pro it'll probably do something. So there's a lot we don't know about this particular drug and what its long-term effects may be. Yet, it's had a dramatic effect on our practices, and we've, been, we've now have another very powerful drug of another class. We're, we're all very excited about this drug. It's very expensive, and you'll notice one nice thing about this drug. Look how often you have to take it. Once a day. Isn't that interesting? It's, it works great once a day. Well, it, the side effects list is not to say everybody gets this. These are things that the, the most frequently occurring side effects are on the list. This isn't the only side effects that it, you may have an unusual side effect, and most people don't get any of the side effects. It's just that these are the ones that occur most frequently if you get side effects. I've been ignoring this fellow for a while. So we've covered the different classes of drugs. Let's, let's talk a little more about it with your questions. Yes? Uh, I don't know what drug I'm on, but I think I'm on this Zalatan. OK. I you think you're on the Zalatan. Is it a little clear bottle with a white cap on it? Yeah. A little tiny bottle. Yeah. Right. right, that's Zalatan. OK. Uh, the first drug I took for five, six days, I got so dizzy I couldn't stand up. So you took another drug that made you very dizzy. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, I mean, this is the, you're, you're dealing head on with the issues that we're talking about. What color cap, what color cap did the uh, first drug have? Was it purple? I, I just you don't remember, okay. Oh, we didn't talk about all the cap colors. Let's do that just for a minute. We had green was the myotics. Okay. Where's that? Oh, no, what happens with that is people feel like they're getting a cold sometimes for the first few days they're on it. It isn't really a cold. It sort of mimics a cold. Interesting, from an eye drop, right? The descriptions that come with the medicine says that if you have blue eyes, it'll turn brown, or if they got brown, it'll turn blue, one or the other. No, everything turns darker. So the, the, and it, that must be the one I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, that is the one you're getting, yes. So, but the important thing is that you had another drug that made you dizzy, and you were lucky. It was recognized that that was the cause. At least somebody was smart enough and astute enough to figure that out. Well, you were smart enough to, to look for it, because you might have called your family doctor thinking something else was wrong. How would you have known? You've been, you've been lucky. Right. Well, let's talk about the top colors so that we can put it on the list if you want to write it down. The myotics are green. The beta blockers are generally yellow. Uh, the epinephrine drugs have white caps. What was the first one? Green, the green, green, the myotics are green. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are orange. <laughs> now, the next group, the alpha-2 agonists, they're, they're, the alpha-gan is purple, but Iapodine is still white, and I wish they would. 
the one, the alpha number five, Roman numeral five. Is the al iop alpha gain is purple, and iopidine is white. And I'm hoping they'll make them both the same color. It'd be a lot easier. Four is orange. Of course, the pills aren't orange. I'm talking about the eye drops. Orange caps. Orange caps, yeah. Right. And then the prostaglandin analogs are the only one is Zalatan right now, and that has a white cap. But it, yeah, and it good to know the color Because it helps, it helps us organize our thinking about how we classify the drugs. And a lot of times people come in, they'll say, uh, I, there'll be a new patient, I say, I take three glaucoma medicines. And I'll say, well, what are they? And they go, I don't know their names. I say, well, what colors are the caps? And they'll be able to tell me, oh, a yellow one, a white one, and a purple one. Well, as it, it looks like Zalatan's more expensive, but if you think about the fact that you only have to use one drop a day, then maybe, maybe it's not more expensive. So it, it, there's a lot of factors that go into how big is the drop? Does the dropper ma make the control the type size of the drop so you get more drops per bottle? There's a lot of issues in here. And things about okay, are generics as good as the uh, the real thing? Are they aren't generics cheaper? Well, yes and no. Again, depending on, like, one company makes a controlled top that you get more drops out of the same bottle. And, of course, your eye doesn't really hold a whole drop, really. So all you need is one. And, you know, even though the generic may be cheaper to buy, you might have, might be more expensive to really use because of that drop size factor. All right, now what happens if you miss one or two nights? Okay, these are good questions now. But before, I'm gonna, we're going to, any other questions about the basic actions or, or, or about the particular classes of drugs before I go on with that. You mentioned with the beta blockers that if you've taken any in the past, can I take it again? No, I didn't say that. I say we, when, we, when we see people and we, before I put them on a drug, hang on, your, your question is, if they've taken a beta blocker before, does that preclude them from taking a beta blocker eye drop? Okay, you think you misunderstood what I said. If, if I see a patient for the first time and I'm thinking about putting them on a beta blocker, I'm thinking, okay, I want to treat them. Let's see. Let's see if they'll be able to tolerate a beta blocker. I ask them, do you have asthma? And I ask them a few questions. And I say, have you ever taken a beta blocker before? And they'll say, well, what's that, like Indoral? And they'll, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I did, and it, it made me dizzy. I mean, so I'm not going to put them on that class of drugs. So, no, if they've taken it before and not had problems, I'll be really happy to give it to them. And sometimes they're on a beta blocker already by mouth, which means some of it's getting in the eye. And that's another factor when you start looking at the pressure, like this fellow back here who had a pressure in the upper teens. One of the questions we asked that person, are you taking any, what, you look at their medicines by mouth and realize that some of them may lower the eye pressure. So maybe he's already partly treated inadvertently. You see what I'm saying? You have to take that into account when you set your goals. So does that answer your question? Okay. Now, any other drug class questions? Uh, what color was uh, number three? Um, white. white. Same as uh, six? Yeah, that's where you're getting the problem. Same as six, same as iopidine in number five. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to get the FDA to be uh, rigorous in forcing the manufacturers to use similar color caps. I wrote purple down for number five. Purple is for alpha GAN. Which number is that? That's one of the types under five. Oh. Oh, see. see, they don't have a class. There's not a color for the class. It's unfortunate. Alpha GAN, no, alpha -GAN is uh, purple. Iopidine is white. Okay, but I'm going to make sure anybody have drug class questions. And we're going to go on and talk. That brings us into another discussion. Okay. Now, we'll go, say your question again. I'm sorry. <laughs> what happens if I, I'm taking that? Zalatan? Zalatan. What happens if I miss one or two nights in a row? Okay. Well, first of all, you'll, you'll know that you're really still human <laughs> and that you forgot, right? <laughs> Um, what, do you, what do you mean, what should you do? Should you make up the lost drops? Is that what you're wondering? You, in other words, your question is, if you miss it for two nights, what, what happens? Well, your pressure probably goes up. 
Well, of course not. You don't feel it when the pressure is up, so you wouldn't know. So what you do is you go back to taking it again. That's yeah. Well, you know, if, if it's very important that your pressure is rigorously controlled and you do that a lot, then you're probably not going to, your glaucoma may get worse. You see, so that's what you're dealing with. But you have to realize that these drugs all, most of them don't wear off immediately. Now, some of them that do wear off very quickly are the myotics in the first class that were given four times a day. That pile of carpine, that bottle is gone out of, it, it stops working in your eye six hours later. It's like you never took it. So you have to keep putting it in. Whereas a beta blocker, it might take two weeks for your pressure to slowly come back up to where it was if you stopped it. In other words, there's washout period. We call them washout periods. So how long does it take for it to lose its effect in your eye? And each drug's different. Some of them wash out in hours, and some of them wash out in weeks. Well, um, that was before my time. Uh, surgery, well, the pilocarpine's been around for a long, long time. And, you know, I'm not sure if the ability to, I think that, I'd, I'd have to look that up, to be honest with you. I don't know. You're talking about a long time ago, to the point where they just discovered that the glaucoma was caused by pressure. Yeah, these, these, the, you're, what you're pointing out is that all this ability to do so much has happened very, soon, very recently. Relatively. Yeah, in the last 50 years, really. Yeah, and most, uh, most of the drugs on this list, on the backside especially, have uh, only become available in the last five or eight years. And I will tell you that I'm going to need a second page probably in the next five years. There'll probably be another three or four classes of drugs that are going to be discovered. So your question, somebody had said before, you were horrified that people could be on three or four. I have patients on four or five drugs, a lot of patients. Can you try one at a time? Well, oh, that's a good, I'm glad you mentioned that. How do you know how many you can add? Okay, here's what you do when you start out treatment. You put somebody on a drug, and what do you do? You put it in one eye. Why would I want to put it in one eye and not both eyes? Does it make you red and you don't know? No. That's not, it's not because it would turn red. Why would I want to test it in one eye? Well, well, no, there's other factors. What about the variation in the pressure we spoke about from day to day? What if we, what if we put somebody on a pressure of 22 on it because we want it down to 16, and we put them on a beta blocker in both eyes, and they come back and it's 16 in both eyes? Now, did that mean that um, the drug knocked it down to 16? Or maybe it varied and it just happened to go lower that day. Here, so what you do <laughs> is you, um, you, you put it in one eye and use the other eye as sort of a theoretic guinea pig. You want to, as a control, and you want to see one, that one you're treating go below the other. Now, it gets a little confusing. The beta blockers get into the bloodstream and they get into the, you put it in one eye, it gets into the bloodstream. You know it does because it causes all these systemic side effects. It actually lowers the pressure some in the other eye. So it gets confusing sometimes when the pressure goes below where you've ever it's seen exact. it. It's not exact. Now, some of the drugs it is. The myotics, it's very exact. The epinephrine drugs, very exact. Um, you start talking about some of the other drugs on the back, and I don't think we know how exact it is yet, like the, the carbonic anhydrase, the trusops, the azops, the alpha GAN. Some of this may get into the bloodstream and affect the other eye, too. But we still do therapeutic trials. And we like to see that the next drug you add lowers the pressure. And we find when we start testing people on multiple drugs, is especially when they're on two or three drugs, when you add the next drug, often it doesn't do anything. So the course not, you stop it. And you add one drug at a time. And if you're going to add a second drug and you end up, you, what you want to do is put them, let's say the pressure's up in both eyes and you put them on the first drug in one eye, it comes down. What you do is you have them take it in both eyes before you add the second drug. So now you've reestablished your baseline of relationship between the pressures. You follow me? Yeah. 
Otherwise, it gets very, conf very confounding to have multiple things going on. You never can figure it out. And once people get on these drugs, they tend to stay on them for years and years and years, and it's uh, very unfair. A lot of times I've seen people on four or five drugs, and you just know in your heart that there's a couple that aren't doing any good, but you don't know which they are. And it's a lot of work to figure it out. You've got to say, okay, let's stop that one drug in one eye and leave it on in the other. It gets confusing. You get older people that can't remember. They forget to take them. They have to come back three or four times to figure it out. And it's just, it's, it'll cost them. It's, it's not easy. And they get, they get burdened by making frequent visits and waiting around. It's, it's a lot to that. Yeah. Right. How does the drug get into the eye? I mean, if you put it in, it's right. on the surface of the eye. Right. It, it has to, right. How does, it, does it absorb, and how, do, how is it that some drugs... Okay, so you want to know how... Okay, how do they... Okay, how, where do the drugs go when you put them in? Yeah. yeah. The, let's see, here's your eyeball, okay? And then you have, around it, you have the eyelids. Okay, so you put the drop into the eye, it gets into the tears. To get into the eye, it has to go through the cornea. That's generally how it gets in. It goes right through the wall of the eye, not porous. It gets in by, it gets in by concentration differences. That's the main reason it gets in. And it has to, be, has to be a balance of different, the compound has to be partly lipid soluble in order to go through the... Uh, the, uh, the membranes of the eye, which aren't just salt, the proteins, they have to be able, it has to get through the tissues. So that's one of the reasons why we haven't, didn't have TRUSOP for many years, because they couldn't get it to penetrate the wall of the eye. Okay, so, so hang on. It goes in through the cornea generally. Probably some goes through the sclera of some of the drugs. I don't think it's been studied that well, but I think generally it goes through the cornea. Now, the rest of it that doesn't get absorbed sits in the tear film and gets, gets absorbed. It goes into your throat, into your nose. And it gets into your throat. And it's a very, that's your nasal mucosa, the, the lining of the inside of your nose is very good at absorbing drugs. So anything that goes down there gets into the bloodstream very quickly. It's almost like pushing it IV. So the beta blockers, you can put in people's eye and uh, they'll have an asthma attack right there in the office. I mean, I've never seen that happen because I wouldn't give an asthmatic a beta blocker, but I've heard that this can happen very quickly. So whatever doesn't go into the uh, eye goes into the tear film, and you'll know some doctors will tell you to press on the corner of your eye after you put the drop in and not, not blink. Put the drop in, not blink, and press on the corner of your eye with the Kleenex. That keeps the drug from getting into your system. Now, hang on. Does that mean I should, everybody should do that? Well, no, I generally don't put, tell people to do that unless they have a side effect from the drug they're trying to avoid. And frankly, I think if they're having a side effect they're trying to avoid, I'd rather try to find another drug that doesn't give them any side effects. But some people like to do this because they just don't believe in drugs getting in their system. And they want to keep it in their eye and not get it in their whole body. Hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on a second. You had a question a while ago. What do you do if you have a very sensitive body in your sensitive Oh, yeah, a lot of people like you. And you know, there's different kinds of sensitivities. There's sensitivities not only because they have side effects very frequently and very sensitive in that way, but there's a lot of people that they put a drop in their eyelids and eye get red and almost have a, like, almost an allergic reaction to it. And I have a lot of patients that can't take any eye drops because of that. And we have to do surgery on them to get the to get the pressures down where we want it. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. We're gonna get we'll get back to you. Yeah. I Why do they pull my eyelid out and put the drop in, in, in the uh -huh. eyelid? Is that correct? You you pull your eyelid out and make a pocket and put it in that way. Yeah. Is that all right? You can do that. You're stretching your eye more than you have to. You may want to just tilt your head back and, and look up, pull the lid down and let it hit your eye or your inside of your eyelid. That's okay to do that. I mean, if, unless you're pulling, I don't want you to overstretch your eyelid particularly, but you could, I mean, if you keep doing it enough. But it would probably hurt a little bit if you were doing that. Doctor, yeah. Do I mean that all the medications are so strong? 
well, maybe you're talking because you're a sensitive person speaking. <laughs> you're saying maybe you're so sensitive that they seem strong to you. Excuse me. Well, so you're, so, you're, so you're sensitive and you have to take that into account when you take your medications. I don't want to go so many <laughs> Are you taking medications now? No, just tears right now because I'm just a suspect. Of so I don't know. The only thing I'm taking is tears. So the only drop you're taking is tears. Okay, so I would cross that bridge when you get to it. Maybe you'll never need to be treated. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Ask me afterwards. I still haven't, I still haven't followed that drop that's gone through the uh, cornea. Oh, you want to where it goes from there? Uh, no, I, I, I have a question about that. Now, you've added some more fluid into that uh, corneal, what do you call the fluid in this? Oh, you want to know what, now, the, the drug that goes into the eye, yeah. It goes in, in that enclosed space, and I don't know, point one, does it increase? the pressure momentarily if it gets resorbed back into the back of the eye does it, does it absorb into the whole eye that these are very good questions so you're asking what happens to that drop after it goes after it goes through here well it, it gets distributed into the fluids in the front of the eye the back of the eye has a gel back here so it doesn't doesn't get into it as quickly but I'm sure some of it gets in there. Some of it probably goes all the way back to the optic nerve. It gets absorbed well, it diffuses its way back there. There's a concentration gradient that when that goes in there, that's not going to make the pressure itself go. It's not like you take a needle and you inject it in and you're squirting fluid in there. It's just diffusing as it goes through. It diffuses through, and that has no net effect on the pressure. Okay? So probably some water would go out to follow it to keep the concentration balanced. So it, it doesn't really, that doesn't raise the pressure particularly. That's a very good question. It's good physics. I'd, I'd really have to look into that question a little more thoroughly to answer that, to be more exact. But I don't think that has a big effect on the pressure. And it, it, it gets in there and it bathes the tissue, either the ciliary body, or it gets right into the trabecular meshwork, or into the muscles back here that contract and pull on the These There's a lot of more fine details in how these drugs works than, than I got into. Well, that's how the meiotics tend to work. Yeah. They open the mesh work up. If you look through there, that's the only drug that really directly works on the mesh work. That's why I think it's an important class of drugs that we shouldn't forget, and it's being forgotten a lot. Okay, we're about out of time, um, but I'm not going to leave in case you have any other particular questions you want to ask me. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay.